The Legend of Zelda, one of the most beloved and influential video game series of all time. By 1993, there were four entries in the series, with each one selling record numbers to an ever-growing audience of hardcore fans. Then this happened. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. How? For that history, we need to go back a few decades. In the late 1970s, Dale DeSharoon was in college working on a degree in film and video production. After graduating, he took a job working as a primary school teacher. In 1979, computers were just coming onto the scene. His principal was interested in this new technology and wanted to get computers for the school. Disharoon wasn't interested in the computers. He wanted the principal to buy woodworking equipment for the school. The principal took Disharoon to a programming workshop at Radio Shack, which got them both excited, despite the fact that they were working on the now-notorious TRS-80s. Seeing the potential in this new technology, the principal acquired some computers for the school, Atari 400s and 800s. Disharoon was enamored by the machines and spent the next few months teaching himself programming so he could make educational games for the kids in his class. At that time, Atari had a user-written software program, Atari Programming Exchange, where they had quarterly submissions, publications, and prizes. Disharoon submitted a couple of his educational games and won the first and second prizes for the quarter they were submitted, which netted him about five or $6,000 worth of computer equipment from Atari. Disharoon's teacher's salary was only about $11,000 per year, so this was a really big deal. Four of his titles were published in the Atari catalog, two of which, Edition Magician and Word Spinner, caught the attention of The Learning Company, who wanted to publish versions for the Apple II. Disharoon saw the potential for growth going beyond being a teacher. He now had to decide to stick with education or make games. After being a teacher for three years, he decided to switch to making games and form the company Dale Disharoon Incorporated. He and his team created games for Spinnaker, The Learning Company, and Prentice Hall. Most of the games were published on the Atari 400, Atari 800, Commodore 64, Apple II, and IBM PC. They also did two ports for SSI, Shiloh and Normandy. One game he was particularly proud of was Below the Root, which was based on a series of books by Zilpha Keatley Snyder. As computers were evolving and the storage space needed for information was increasing, companies were looking into alternatives to the cartridge and floppy disk-based formats. In 1982, the Dutch company Philips, along with the Japanese company Sony, co-developed the Compact Disc, or CD, which was originally designed to only store and play sound recordings. They were later adapted to store data and would come to be called CD-ROMs. Each CD held up to 744 megabytes of data, which allowed them to have up to 72 minutes of full motion video. Not the best quality full motion video, but since this was still in its infancy, it was seen as impressive at the time. Philips and Sony worked together to develop the first consumer-oriented compact disc interactive player, which they named simply Philips CDI. While this was going on, Sony was working with Nintendo to develop a CD-ROM attachment to the Super NES that was to be called the Super NES CD. Nintendo broke their agreement with Sony, who went off to make a little something called the PlayStation. But that's a whole other story you probably already heard. With Sony out, Nintendo got into a new contract with Philips to design their Super NES CD add-on. This was all going on while Philips was still working on their CDI. After seeing how poorly the Sega CD add-on was selling, Nintendo decided not to make the CD add-on and ended their contract with Philips. As part of dissolving the agreement with Philips, Nintendo allowed them to use some of their characters for games on the CDI. The arrangement wasn't a license of five games, but five characters. Link, Zelda, Ganon, Mario, and one other. While working on the hardware, they were looking for developers to make content for the device. In 1987, after working with Spinnaker and creating numerous titles for them over the years, Disharoon moved from Northern California to Boston, Massachusetts to help build a CDI team for Spinnaker Software. Spinnaker was looking for additional computer game artists to work with them on a short contractual basis and hired a small group of around five or six. One of them was artist Rob Dunlavey. Dunlavey had just graduated from the University of Southern California and had been living in Boston. He worked with the other contract people under Disharoon. Philips was looking to have a large catalog of titles for the system when it launched in 1988. Disharoon was hired as the design lead and to help understand the capabilities and limits of the CDI platform. 
He worked with his supervisor, Steve Yellick from MIT, who knew a lot about laser technology, as well as image compression. He unfortunately didn't know much about video games. Roughly a year into the project, Yellick sadly committed suicide. Without a lead, Disharoon took over as the manager of the development group. During this time, Disharoon got married and changed his last name to Disharoon. The original idea for Disharoon was to only be with Spinnaker for a year, since Phillips was planning on releasing the CDI in 1988. However, due to constant delays with the hardware and operating system, one year turned into four. Unfortunately, as time went by, the system was being surpassed by computers. Originally, they were ahead of the game with the CD technology, but now, CDs were becoming a standard part of both PCs and Macs. Beyond that, every year computers were getting more memory and faster processors, while the CDI was stuck with its original 1987 hardware. It was now 1990, and the CDI was using the 68000 chip, which was a chip used in the first Mac computers. The chip was dreadfully slow, which limited what they could do with the system. Beyond these limitations, there wasn't much they could do with the sprites they designed. There was no hardware sprite technology, so all the movement of characters required the pushing of pixel data by the strained 68000 chip. The video RAM was so small, they could only scroll about 2 to 2.5 screens horizontally. It became clear this was not going to be a game system, which was what Philips wanted. They didn't believe the market for this system would be games. This was reinforced by the executives at American Interactive Media, or AIM, who were the publishing arm of Philips CDI software. They were openly hostile towards games. One of the top executives of AIM was from the film business and didn't see the value in having this device as a gaming machine. For the company, they weren't trying to compete with Nintendo and Sega. They were trying to introduce something entirely new to the market. They were more relaxed on gaming content aimed at younger children, which fell under the umbrella of edutainment like Paint School and Story Machine. During that time, DeSharon and his team built Laser Lords, Alice in Wonderland, Sargon Chess, Paint School 1 and 2, and Story Machine 1 and 2. This completed the contractual obligation Spinnaker had with Philips. Philips' goal was to get people to buy the machine for home educational purposes, which was where they decided to focus their energies. Their focus changed when the consumer model launched in 1991, when it turned out the only titles that sold were video games. Titles like Treasures of the Smithsonian, which had a budget of well over a million dollars, was being outsold by the much smaller Laser Lords. The executives now demanded they put all their efforts into making games. As the focus shifted to game development, the limitations of the system became even more clear. The infrared controller for the CDI was analog instead of digital, and the infrared made it slow and unresponsive, something you wouldn't notice on a virtual tour, but most definitely would take issue with while playing a video game. It also had no MIDI music capability or sound effect generation processor. When Philips designed the machine, they thought those things wouldn't be needed when you can play full CD audio. The problem was, those forms of audio data had to either stream off the CD or be stored in memory, and even the lowest level of ADPCM took up way more space than MIDI data or sound chip code. Beyond that, the CD-ROM drive was also a problem. The drive itself was only single speed, with horrendously slow seek times. If you were streaming music off the CD, you couldn't go out and seek graphic data from the CD at the same time, unless you interleave the graphics with the audio, which was possible, but that limited interactivity. So you had a system that may have been better suited to large RPGs or strategy games, but couldn't easily save complex game states. The system was released at $800, so needless to say, it wasn't flying off the shelves. After the launch of Spinnaker's seven CDI titles, DeSharon left the company. As this was a long and drawn out process combined with how hard it was to create for the system, Spinnaker had no plans to continue CDI development. DeSharon, along with most of the CDI team from Spinnaker, reopened DDI in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and were able to get development funding from AIM to continue making titles for the CDI. Unfortunately, there was no available commercial space in Cambridge at the time, so DeSharon's team all worked out of his West Concord home. The executives at AIM weren't game people, but they understood that a well-known character would help to sell games. Since they had the rights to some very well-known Nintendo characters, AIM wanted ideas, so DDI pitched them two games, one for Link and one for Zelda. The executives had no idea who they were, but they saw the NES sales numbers and agreed to produce these games for the CDI. The budgets were low, 
Each one was going to cost around $600,000 to develop. They made a pitch to maximize the quality of the games by combining the funding to develop only one game engine that would be used for both games. To put things into perspective, in 1991-92, a U.S. technical employee cost about $100,000 a year to support, which was the salary, taxes, office space, equipment, insurance, and administration costs. This was also when a 1 gigabyte hard drive cost about $3,000. The development team included DeSharon, three programmers, one audio engineer slash composer, four artists, a producer, and a single freelance writer who'd write all the scripts as well as help design both games. Work began on the games in early 1991, which was the better part of a year before Link to the Past was released in Japan. So at this point, there were still only two games in the franchise. AIM had high hopes for the games, and with the Nintendo license, they were looking for these to be a major selling point to highlight the system. Although for the DDI team, it wasn't going to be easy. They had roughly $1.2 million to build an engine from scratch on hardware that wasn't designed for games and make two separate video games that would showcase the power of what this system could do. AIM had high expectations and wanted some type of full motion animation in the games which was going to be incredibly difficult considering both the hardware and the budget. A mutual friend put DeSharon in touch with Igor Razboff. Razboff had a PhD in higher mathematics and computer science from the University of St. Petersburg, Russia. He'd been in the U.S. for 12 years and previously worked at Bell Labs and Computer Vision. With the Berlin Wall coming down, Razboff wanted to return to St. Petersburg to build a company there that would provide some type of service to U.S. companies. DeSharon spoke to Razboff about the prospect of doing the animation for these two games. DeSharon had seen numerous animated films coming out of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and thought they could handle the animation over there. He liked the particular style and also figured it could be done for a fraction of the cost of U.S. animators. DDI then became Animation Magic with two studios, one in the U.S. and the other in St. Petersburg. DeSharon went to St. Petersburg with Razboff and hired about six people who had some experience with 2D animation. They brought them to the U.S. for six months and put them up in apartments in Massachusetts near the Cambridge office. They gave them computers, scanners, and any other tools they needed to work. DeSharon took the new Russian employees to the local art supply store, and they were all blown away by the assortment and quality of the materials that were readily available. There was nothing even close to this in Russia. The artists worked on animation paper scanned it into the computer where they cleaned up the lines and colors, then they transferred their work to the CDI. While they didn't speak perfect English, it was good enough to where everyone was able to understand each other. The Russian artists all had very good senses of humor, and everyone got along just fine. The team did discuss their designs with Nintendo, and would run their sketches past them for approval. They were interested in how the Link and Zelda characters looked because the previous two entries were both 8-bit incarnations. The NES just didn't have a resolution like the CDI so the Animation Magic team could make the characters look more like cartoons. For references, they used the Legend of Zelda 1 and 2 Japanese box art and manuals, which was much different from the US art. This was like making the characters on the covers come alive in a way that just wasn't possible with the NES hardware. For the two games, they decided to go with a side-scroller style like Adventures of Link instead of the top-down style like the original Legend of Zelda. The reason being was that Philips would never have approved the top-down style, because to them it looked old and wasn't making use of the CDI's capabilities. Aside from that, they were taking the characters and designing two entirely original games. They had no input from Nintendo, so they were deciding for themselves what the story should be about. They were doing things backwards from how licensed games usually work. Many game companies would have a game and then acquire a license as a skin to put on their game. With this, they had the license already and were able to develop whatever game they wanted. Well... Really, whatever they could possibly make within the confines of the hardware. Philip's biggest concern was that their product stood out from the pack. Since the executives weren't gamers, they didn't care about gameplay. To them, it didn't matter if it was fun or not. They just wanted it to be visually appealing. Disharon's hands were full. He was going back and forth from the office in Cambridge, working with programmers on building the engine, then over to the animators, going through the script, and teaching them the process of how they were going to get the animations done. He also hired U.S.-based artists who were working on the game artwork itself, taking a step back to look at where they were, and you could see how unusual all this was going to be. To put all of this into perspective, 
A Japanese company licensed out their IPs to a Dutch company who hired an American company to create games with this IP, who then hired Russian artists to design the cutscenes. It was indeed very unusual. While the cutscene animation was from the Russian animators, the backgrounds, all the real-time character animation, and the in-game animation was done in the office at Cambridge. Each background was beautifully painted by artist Rob Dunleavy, which did help them make the game stand out. He designed all the overworld and background scenes. He painted both overworld maps. His friend, Tom Curry, was hired to paint the Zelda backgrounds. They also hired an additional group of artists to work on the animation sprites. Dunleavy's inspiration for the drawings and paintings was Disney's Pinocchio and the wonderful background designs by Gustav Tengren. The paintings were rendered in Photoshop and Painter. Sadly, because of the restrictions from the CDI, the paintings were all small, 240 pixels tall, 1,152 pixels wide, at 72 dpi, for a three-screen scrolling background. For perspective, here's the full painting with those dimensions. For the voice actors, they auditioned local union actors and chose the voices for the game. Since they had to choose the union voice actors they could afford, the end result wasn't the best. How about a kiss for Locke? You've got to be kidding. They created about 10 minutes of 2D animation in each game which created a lot of audio they needed to edit. The music was also created in-house in the Cambridge studio by composer Tony Trippi. Trippi had previously worked with DeSharon over at Spinnaker. Regardless of how the animation and the voice acting was turning out, the music was beautiful. The unfortunate side of this was that because of the hardware limitations, the music had to restart every time you entered a new area, so most players would only hear the beginning of each track as they moved from screen to screen. Even though the executives at AIM weren't gamers, many of the people who worked on the games were fans of the original two. While all this was going on, Nintendo released two more Legend of Zelda titles a Link to the Past for the Super NES, and Link's Awakening for the Nintendo Game Boy. Despite all the hardships they encountered while designing on the CDI hardware, they were able to have the two games ready in a little over a year. That is no small feat. Link, The Faces of Evil, and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon were both released simultaneously on October 10th, 1993 in the US. Critics praised the animated sequences and colorful backgrounds, but trashed the gameplay and the really terrible voice acting. The games looked great for the time, but the unresponsive controls made playing the game a chore. However, the control problem had a simple fix. While the infrared remote made the games impossible, playing the games with the hardwired controller made the game play the way it was supposed to. Unfortunately, most people didn't know this, and there was no easy way to spread that information. People were disappointed, which DeSharon understood. However, with the amount of time they had, and what they were able to create within that time, he thought they did a good job. The team wasn't Nintendo, and yet they were being compared to Nintendo. From that perspective, it's no wonder audiences felt let down. Although here was a company that made two games in the span of a year that were flawed, but still good in their own ways. They were never going to achieve the level of brilliance of a first-party Nintendo game. They just didn't have the time, manpower, or the budget. Unfortunately, Philips drastically underestimated the time and costs involved in game production. Since the machine wasn't designed to be a traditional game console, it was an insanely difficult uphill battle to be able to make it into one. They were expecting more graphics, more production values in terms of music, visuals, animation, and so on. They also weren't a game company. They just shifted into that role when they saw their product tanking, although they really needed to do more to compete. A dedicated game console like the NES or SNES were both around $199. Here was a device that was four times that, and they needed to have something truly amazing to make that price seem justified. They introduced a slimmed-down model with a new controller at a lower price point to appeal to gamers, but it wasn't enough. They wanted the CDI to be seen as an all-in-one package. Education, games, movies, and so forth. Kind of similar to game consoles now, if you think about it. Philips started running infomercials showcasing all the different things the device could do beyond games, but in the end, most just saw it as an expensive novelty device. Even the 3DO, 
which was another CD-based console ahead of its time, launched at $699, which was just too much for the average gamer. Dunlavey was hired as an art director for Animation Magic, and in April of 1993, he spent two weeks in St. Petersburg hiring and training artists. While there, he worked with them on a game called Mutant Rampage Body Slam, for which their greatest reference was the 1982 film Blade Runner. It was a futuristic fighting game for the CDI, and they were able to take what they learned in development of the Zelda games and apply that here. While the gameplay was still somewhat stiff, the animated cutscenes were much more vibrant. Ah, these humans think they know about pain. We've got something to teach them. <laughs> Many consider this to be one of the best, if not the best, game on the CDI. The CDI had two other lesser-known Nintendo games for the console, Hotel Mario and another Legend of Zelda game, Zelda's Adventure. This one was made by another company who did it in the overhead style like the original and Link to the Past. It's actually a worse game than the other two, but it came out so much later in the life cycle of the CDI that it's not as well known. Rumor has it the game was released unfinished, and considering how little money Philips had at the time, and how the game plays, it's easy to believe. The CDI ended production and was discontinued by Philips in 1998. Animation Magic went on their way and started working with other studios. They eventually grew to employ 150 people. The studio was working on a very high-profile game, Warcraft Adventures, Lord of the Clans for Blizzard, which was almost completed but was never officially published. The game did leak onto the internet a few years back. Warcraft Adventures was almost entirely done in the studio in St. Petersburg. In 1995, Animation Magic was sold to Capital Multimedia. DeSharon became the executive producer for the Davidson and Broderbund titles, and he went back to making edutainment titles. In 1996, DeSharon hired Dunlavey to design some backgrounds for a new project aimed at younger players. It was a fantasy setting similar to Link and Zelda. However, with dwindling resources, the project was scrapped. In 1997, Capital Multimedia liquidated their assets and sold them all off individually for about $2.5 million. Blizzard purchased the Animation Magic Studio in St. Petersburg. DeSharon left to start a new company by himself. He moved to the Ukraine and founded Boston Animation. They did eventually move back to Massachusetts, settling in Stowe, which was 21 miles outside of Boston. As the president of Boston Animation, DeSharon continued to work in the industry, creating artwork and animation for numerous games like EverQuest 1 and 2 and other properties from Sony. The last game by Boston Animation was Darkened Sky, which was a mess on the PC, but DeSharon says he is very proud of the GameCube version. Sadly, DeSharon died in 2008 from leukemia. While over the years, Zelda CDI games have become the butt of many jokes, by learning a bit about its history, I think it's impressive what they were able to pull off. They built a brand new game engine, designed 20 minutes of full motion animation including speech, had two full soundtracks, and made two completely different video games to launch on a console that absolutely wasn't designed to play video games. They did all of this in the span of a little over a year. DeSharon poured heart and soul into these games, and while they were broken, he was proud of what they were able to accomplish. He was sad at the criticism the games received, largely by people who more than likely never played them. They just heard they were awful. Animation Magic wasn't a AAA game company, nor did they have the time and budget of Nintendo. They were a newly formed, underfunded, small studio. DeSharon said, Every game has its story. Not just the story of the game, but a story of what the situation was in terms of how it was built, where it went, and what the different facets are in terms of timing, money, constraints from the hardware, and constraints from the publisher. So I have a lot of compassion and empathy for all the companies that get great games actually made out the door. To enjoy the games, you need to ensure a few things. Ignore all the cinemas, or if you're like me, laugh at their silliness. Link told me about you. You know Link? Sure, he gave me his canteen for a kiss. You kissed him? Here, it's empty anyway. Make sure you have a fully working CDI with a functioning save state support. On some systems, if the internal battery dies, saving is forever disabled, as the battery can't be replaced without a lot of work. Get a hardwired three-button action controller. Have an open mind. Don't play them compared to the originals. Rather think of them as a pair of 2D side-scrolling adventures. 
released at the beginning of the 1990s, that have nothing to do with Nintendo. Getting a working system with a controller is easier said than done. It's much cheaper to play them on an emulator, but be prepared for the janky controls and a lot of fine-tuning to get them to work close to properly. Both games are essentially the same. You start with a large map, too large to fit on a single screen, and three selectable areas. You can choose any of them to start. Finishing a stage usually involves getting a key and then making it to the end to strike a Triforce. Doing so ends the stage, opening up a new one on the map, and so you progress. Occasionally, instead of a Triforce, you have to fight a boss. The problems from the gameplay largely stem from the limitations of the hardware. The biggest problem is control, in that you only have four directions and two action buttons, which was less options than even an NES pad. Jumping's done by pushing up. Sword attacks are done with button one. Access in the inventory, meanwhile, is done by ducking and pushing button two. The same button is signed for using special items. This is incredibly annoying, since it means you can't use items like bombs or anything else while ducking. Some people complain it's impossible to avoid enemy projectiles without getting hit, resulting in repeated deaths. However, if you read the booklet, you know that Link or Zelda's shield can only become active if you stand still. So in order to use the shield, you have to do nothing, and all those enemy axes, rocks, and spears will simply bounce off. The majority of the people complaining about this are most likely playing on an emulator, and as such, have never seen the manual. The games are indeed difficult, but the same can be said of nearly every game from that time period. Is Ninja Gaiden known for being easy? Although to be fair, that one does have tight controls, it's just really hard. If you play the games casually, the way they're meant to be played, you can beat each one in about four hours. There's no game over, you just go back to the beginning of the last stage you're on. So if you get a little better each time, you'll progress through the game and eventually get to the end. What happened? <laughs> Nothing, Link. We were just about to have a feast. Great! <laughs> <laughs> I think if the games were played with just the hardwired controller and the cutscenes were ignored, they'd mostly be remembered for being unique side stories in the Legend of Zelda franchise, instead of the black spot on its history. Although it's possible that because of the animated cutscenes, the games have become infamous rather than completely forgotten. Like the last Zelda CDI game. Almost no one talks about that one. I didn't even know it existed until I started looking into the others. Unfortunately, due to copyrights, the games most likely will never be ported to another system. It's possible, but given the general disdain for the properties, most companies wouldn't bother. Nintendo especially likes to bury anything from the past that sullies their name. Look at how hard they try to get people to forget the Super Mario Brothers movie. Although, never say never. Howard Lincoln, the president of Nintendo of America in 1993, said that Night Trap will never appear on a Nintendo system. Well, here we are 28 years later, and... I want to take this time to thank my friend John Schipanik for helping me with the research on this one. He was the last person to interview Dale DeSharon before his untimely passing, and he was able to give me a great deal of information. If you like Japanese games, his trilogy of books, The Untold History of Japanese Game Developers, are great reads. I also want to thank Rob Dunlavey for telling me about the original paintings. He still has a lot of the old, original artwork. Unfortunately, they're all on formats that aren't supported anymore and very hard to actually see without digging up old hardware. He also auctioned off some of the original paintings for charity years ago. Dunlavey now makes children's books and continues to draw and paint every day. If you want to see his beautiful work, I'll put a link down below in the description. Enough. My ship sails in the morning. I wonder what's for dinner. Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! When I was putting this together, it came to my attention that someone released remasters of the two games. I haven't played them yet, but apparently they fix many of the problems the originals had. So that may now be the easiest way to check out the games.